This is a crazy episode of Wine Talks with Zach Abbott of Zbiotics, who's created a, and I can't say anti-hangover, but I can say a g- genetically modified product, a probiotic, that'll actually make you feel better in the morning if you had a little too much to drink. Crazy episode. If you're going to give a gift this season for wine, consider the original Wine of the Month Club. Been in business since 1972, curating wine for its members. Two bottles a month, every other month or quarter. Incredible value, incredible wines, something for the novice, something for the experienced wine enthusiast. Use the promo code Paul K, P A U L K, when you go to wineofthemonthclub.com. Now to the show Carson, Leno, Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today in beautiful Southern California, about to have a conversation with Zachary Abbott of, I don't even know the name of the company. What's the name of the company? Zbiotics. Zbiotics. Sorry, that's on here. <laughs> Wine Talks, of course, available on uh, iTart Radio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out for podcasting, and sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, now sporting the Napa and uh, organic series of wines. Hey, listen, have a have a conversation or have a listen to Leah Povetta of Glenelli Wine from South Africa. She's up right now. Just went out yesterday. She's absolutely intoxicating conversation with this young woman who has a, a South African, English, and French accent. So you can understand where I'm coming from. But it's a great conversation to have a listen. But not while we're here today. We're here to have a conversation with Zachary Abbott about uh, Z-Biotics and... Um, a product that I think all of you are going to be interested in, which is an anti-hangover product. And so we have a few conversations about that. It's some interesting conversation. But Zachary, welcome to the show. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you about this. So do they call you doctor? <laughs> they do not. Uh, even though <laughs> I, I do have a PhD in microbiology, but uh, that is, you know, I typically don't, you know, make people do that. <laughs> Although I did make my older brothers do it a little bit. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. That's what, yeah. <laughs> just, no, just, so I yeah. always wonder, you know, when you, when you talk to an, uh, an educated, yeah. an education PhD versus sort of a medical doctor, when I, right. when I say doctor, my, my wife's uh, cousin insists on it. And uh, yeah. I had a conversation right. with a, there was a guy named Clinton Lee. We ought to talk to him too, actually. Uh, he, runs a product, an organization called the Asian Pacific Wine and Spirits Institute. Uh, he is a PhD in business, incredible conversation. So somebody will have to connect you with, uh, on this oh, yeah. product. So, great. but tell, tell me this track about becoming a, uh, PhD in microbiology. What, what was that about? What were you thinking? Was there, was there an entrepreneurial spirit behind this in the beginning? What, what happened here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, actually, no, I, I, um, you know, I finished, I, I went to undergrad and I studied science, but I also studied uh, classical art and archaeology. I was kind of all over the map and, um, had a lot of interest, but wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and so after college, I, I actually went out and just had a series of different kinds of jobs, testing different things out and, um, got back, I knew I was always interested in science. And so I got back into science. Um, I you know, did some bartending and construction work even. And then, uh, I got, I was working at, uh, I, got a job at a chemistry lab and was doing environmental chemistry for a little while. But my, my real passion or interest was in biology. Um, and so I, I ended up getting a job at UC Davis doing uh, work in, a, in an HIV research lab uh, there for about a year and a half and really loved that. And so that's what inspired me to go back and get my PhD. I, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do, but I knew this is what I wanted to be in. And, and looking around at the opportunities, having a PhD would definitely open some, some doors into some things I wanted to do. Um, but I don't, come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, I, entrepreneurship was not on my radar at all. In fact, the original seed for the idea that would become Zubiotics actually happened before it, when I was working at that lab at, uh, at UC Davis. Um, and, uh, I ended up going through my whole PhD and, and just thinking about that idea, but never really working on it and never really thinking of it as a business idea, more just thinking of it as a, a cool science or project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, through a series of events, like some friends kind of and uh, hearing what I had to say and kind of saying, Hey, you should start a company and, and encouraged me to apply to some um, startup acceleration and things like that. That's really when I kind of got moving on, on actually turning this into a company. So uh, I was never intentional. Uh, I think of myself as a scientist more than an entrepreneur, but then fell into it. And it's been a really fun journey kind of bringing this product to market. Interesting. Uh, that you're an archeology span major and that now yeah. you're in the right. alcohol sort of the periphery alcohol business because the oldest 
winery ever discovered was in Armenia, 6,000 years old, which, which when you think about that age and the fermentation sciences being used back then, yeah, you know, isn't that crazy? It's honestly not that different. It's so really, I, I always like joke that, you know, microbiology was probably like the oldest science that we intentionally did uh, through fermentation, um, you know, even from intentionally fermenting alcohol from, you know, fruits and grains and stuff for exactly for, you know, 6,000 years. So um, there's a lot of, of history of us being microbiologists. So, I, I, you know, there is a connection there for sure. Well, that's, that's an interesting point, actually, because I bring this up frequently with winemakers trying to understand, you know, what's the end game when you think about it, if fermentation science really is just, it really is microbiology. It's, it happens on its own. If you leave a cluster of grapes around, they're going to ferment uh, because it's, you know, in the skins. My daughter's a boulanger. She understands fermentation science from the you know baking standpoint. Right. But if you think about it, what is the end game for all the technologies we used to potentially make a wine better or any f- fermented uh, beverage other than the fact that you're just playing off of what's already there. Well, I think that that's the best uh, outcome, honestly, is like, look, there's 3 billion years of evolutionary history here, right? Like bacteria and uh, in particular, but then, you know, we use yeast a lot for these fermentations that are a little bit younger than bacteria, but uh, that's a lot of time that they've gone around for perfecting this art. And so I think the best that, we can do really is rather than try and control every facet of it is to work with nature and, um, and work with kind of like uh, the billions of years of evolutionary history that have resulted in this process. And so um, I think that guiding it um, or like leveraging parts we want and like and cleaning out parts we don't um, is really the ultimately going to be the most efficient way for us to get to the best product with, with everything. I think when it comes to like thinking about biotechnology, even more broadly than fermentation, which is, you know, there's a lot of really incredible processes that have evolved over a long time from a biological standpoint. And so I think our task is, uh, as scientists and, and humans is really just, um, looking and, and deeply understanding how those processes work and then leveraging them, um, plugging them together in ways that are most efficient rather than trying to reinvent the wheel every time. So, um, I think that's, that's the good outcome. Well, that's, that'll bring me right to one of the questions I had, which was this GMO, you know, this, um, the GMO conversation, right? We see all this packaging. It says non, you know, GMO, blah, 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 blah. And it seems to be a very important part of, of, of today's microbiology, an important part of the evolution process you're talking about, an important part of moving the needle on a lot of, a lot of things biologically. Is that not the case? No, I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective as, a microbiologist and a synthetic biologist, somebody who works with genetic engineering, I, I think that it's an incredibly interesting and valuable tool uh, in the toolbox. Like, does that mean that everything that's GMO is good or bad? Like, definitely not. It's a tool and it can be used like any other tool to kind of create beneficial or harmful pro- products or be used in kind of like beneficial or harmful ways. And so I think that a lot of like these um, sort of unsavory business practices that have been uh, that have been used around genetic engineering have unfortunately kind of been conflated with the technology itself. And so a lot of people who like sort of self-identify as anti-GMO or non-GMO um, are really sort of like uh, upset about like the use of, you know, maybe the use or overuse, depending on how you look at it, of glyphosate and, uh, you know, Roundup uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the way that certain businesses have used, have used genetic engineering and sort of for, for, bit for the, for business purposes. Um, but I think that actually a lot of those people would actually align with the values that, um, are, you know, pursued by genetic engineering. So the idea that we can make, you know, more resistant crops that are more hardy, um, means that we can protect humanity from famine better. We can use less acres to grow the same amount of food, meaning Mm -hmm. less deforestation and less monoculture. I think, um, that there's a lot of sustainability arguments you can make for the use of genetic engineering, that doesn't mean that it's always used well. And so I'm certainly not saying that like all GMOs are good, but I think the technology can be leveraged for good. And, and part of our mission actually at Zbiotics is, is trying to elevate that conversation, right? Like to, to beyond good or bad um, into a more nuanced understanding, like, like with any other technology, right? At first, I think that there's this sort of kind of um, vocal fear and, and for good reason, right? Like there, there needs to be a check and balance on like new technologies and making sure that they don't run willy nilly, but 
you know, if you think about like metallurgy, um, as an example, right? Like it can be used to make a gun or a spoon and people who are anti guns are not anti metallurgy, right? Like, because they understand that the technology that built the product they don't like is not the problem. The, the problem is the use of that technology and, it, and genetic engineering is a technology and it can be used to make round or bready corn or it can be used to make, um, you know, human insulin, um, which is actually the, one of the, mm-hmm. probably the first mm-hmm. use case of genetic engineering was, um, you know, uh, uh, Genentech engineered E. coli to make human insulin. Before that, we were isolating insulin from pigs and cows. Um, we'd literally slaughter them by the tens of millions um, to isolate uh, insulin from their their liver and pancreas um, and then load them up on the huge refrigerated trucks and, and isolate them. And now we can produce the same amount of insulin and then basically an incubator the size of a uh, of a refrigerator. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And so that's a really positive use of genetic engineering. And I don't think anybody would be anti-GMO in that scenario, right? Because it's the life-saving medicine, but, um, you know, there's been other uses that have been not so great. So anyway, the goal is to kind of like elevate above that. Um, and I think that to your point, you walk through the grocery store and you see a lot of like non-GMO butterfly kind of labels on all the food. And, mm-hmm. and that's unfortunate. I think a lot of brands have really jumped on the bandwagon here to fan the flames of fear in order to sell their products better. And so the doubt that's a very short sighted strategy. The downside of that is it's throwing a very useful technology under the bus to make a few bucks now. Um, and uh, I think that like, that's sort of an, uh, a taking advantage of consumer fear around, um, around genetic engineering, which is too bad. I think that's accurate. I mean, does it, the consumerism of all things, uh, let's just take organic wines for a second. I mean, it's sure. the same thing. It is so much, so much of the wines are already organic. So many families over the history of wine, uh, were growing things organically. They were, they didn't want their kids crawling in the vineyards with pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides. Is it, but does GMO, does GMO fly in the face of like a biodynamic farm? Is that, I mean, obviously they're complete opposites, but does it, right. is it a conflict? I would, I, I, Yes, you see, I would argue that it shouldn't be. Um, right now, by definition, it is in the sense that um, that organic is currently defined as like as both not using synthetic pesticides and, and fertilizers, and also not using genetic engineering. But I think that like really the the goal, um, the underlying goal of, of organic farming and um, it is the same. Like as it's currently applied today, if you really think about organic farming, what it really is is it's sort of like 17th century agri like the the cutting edge agricultural technology from the 17th century applies sure. today. Right. Um, so that in and of itself is not obviously not a good thing, right? We have a much bigger um, human race to feed these days. So using old technology is not good. But the reason we want, we want that is because we're afraid of or reacting to the technologies we're using today. And I think that it's uh, organic farming is basically throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's, it's saying that we don't want these bad things. So we won't take anything. Um, and, and, that is really at the end of the day, not a sustainable choice either, because you can't, um, you basically, you're being more inefficient, um, with the land and you're not using the land to its full potential that way. Um, and so using genetic engineering is a great way for, for instance, to achieve the same goals of sustainability and reduce pesticide usage, reduce, um, uh, uh, uh fertilizer Herbicide. usage, right? Like, so like you could, you know, for instance, like you can use genetically engineered microbes that help fix nitrogen, um, directly, um, to the plants, uh, root nodules, rather than using a ton of, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, which is one of the most damaging kind of ecological practices that we have in, in agriculture. And so, um, Mm. there's, there's some really cool things you could do, right. That like that, where we are uh, trying to achieve the same goals here of sustainability and like, and better stewardship of the land. And I think that genetic engineering is a great tool for that. Now it has been used to the antithesis of that without a doubt, but unfortunately throwing out the whole technology because of the bad actors is I think like a step in the wrong direction. Um, you know, so the, the, I was really book, advocate for kind of like the uniting of those two. The book, um, the third plate by Dan Barber, the famed chef at Blue Hill farms in, in uh, New York and, you know, farm to table cooking and all that. Uh, he talks about that in his book and he talks about, yeah, we can't, you can't feed the world. Uh, with yeah. the production of organic and specifically exactly. biodynamic farms, you know, he There's also the reason talks, why they cost more, right. They're less right. efficient, you know, yeah. less efficient. And then it always, always better, by the way, they don't, sometimes I've had a pretty couple of bad carrots over there from whole foods market. <laughs> right. So, yeah. um, so here's a question I've been asking. And I had a nurseryman on the show and he's a, you know, obviously his job is to fly around the world and, 
and recommend to uh, based on terroir and soil content and all the chemicals in the soil, the natural uh, uh, value of the soil to uh, recommend um, particular vines. And so I said, well, you know, there's 40,000 strains of wheat, for instance, all of them probably, you know, naturally hybrid, right? We, we, we cross strain wheat to be more resistant to weather. We cross strain wheat to be uh, adaptable to certain terroir types. Uh, How is that different than GMO? We're changing the molecular structure. Yeah. All right. I, I would agree. I think in principle, it's the same. It's just an older and less effective way to do the exact same thing. Um, it's, and quite frankly, more dangerous because basically when we do plant crossbreeding, yeah, the goal is right in every situation that we're describing here, the goal is to move a desirable trait from one plant to another, um, or one organism to another. Um, and so if we do plant crossbreeding, we basically say like, I want to retain like the juiciness of this grape, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to get the, like the hardiness of this root. Uh, or, or whatever, this other part of the great plant, right? And the, so you, you cross those plants um, and uh, you select for the ones where you, you know, a whole bunch of different outcomes will happen because it's just totally blind. You're just mashing their DNA together and, and whatever crosses over what is whatever crosses over. And so at some point, some, some percentage of them will get sort of like those two traits together that you wanted. It also will have changed a bunch of other things that you have no idea about. It's a complete black, black box. And the idea that that's a natural crossover and therefore safe in some way is kind of absurd because we have plenty of examples from uh, mm-hmm. history of, of crossing over and having, you know, first and foremost, I think the idea that nature is safe in and of itself is crazy. Like, I think people don't like, I mean, everybody knows that like there are so many poisonous plants out there and every known toxin um, and poison pretty mm-hmm. much comes from plants. Uh, they're mm-hmm. probably our most dangerous enemies in a lot of ways. Um, and so, and, and that can happen a lot. Like there's a good story about um, the Lenape potato where they were basically trying to cross these two potatoes to get, they saw that this uh, South American varietal of potato um, was uh, uh, really hardy and resistant to insects. And then they crossed it with this, like this, this um, North American potato that um, had the perfect like carbohydrate and moisture, uh, uh, like, amounts percentages to make a perfect potato chip and so they basically wanted to keep that but then also have it be like resistant to pests like this 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 uh, south american potato. so they crossed them and they made this lenape potato which had all these properties and we're so excited about it but it turns out that the way that the plant was resistant to the, to the pest was that it expressed um this toxic molecule um which at a threshold below what would make a human sick um, but then when they crossed it with this other potato, which also expressed different versions of that chemical, then together it made one that made a bunch of people sick. And so they had to pull wow. the potato before we got started. And it's so like, that was like safe genetic engineering and that we were crossing plants, but we had no idea what was happening um, uh, in the genetics. And what's great about modern genetic engineering is that we can have perfect clarity into every single piece of uh, every single base pair in the, in the chromosome, right? So we could, we could have literally taken the trait we wanted, put it in there and not worried about all the other things that were happening there. And then we'd have, we could have full genome sequence and know exactly what we did. And we'd obviously have to test it to make sure that the outcome was what we anticipated. But um, there's so much more control and clarity when you're using modern technology as opposed to ancient technology, which we understand and agree with in kind of other areas. And I think it gets a little dicey when it comes to people's food. Uh, but ultimately, that's kind of where we think we need to head is, is having a more clarity and understanding. I am so happy that I got a legitimate answer that I can have that conversation, particularly with millennials about, <laughs> about GMO. Actually, you mentioned something interesting about the toxin of plants. My father is a, a thesis at USC when he got his master's was that he found in a plant in Southern California, the natural antidote to uh, German nerve gas. Oh, wow. Uh, so unfortunately it was just a few years late. The war was already over, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he found it. So that it tells you how toxic, plants that can be as we all know, but anyway, but I thought that was interesting. Can you tell then, I suppose since you're using, um, you know, chromosomes to fix these or modify these things that you can look at the micro, the uh, the molecules of a plant and determine whether it was genetically modified in in the lab or whether it was hybrid because you can focus on particular gene genes by doing that. Or would you not know? You probably could. I think you could probably figure it out. Um, it'd be like anything else. I guess if, if you didn't know before, um, there are certain markers that you would look for and uh, um, that would tell you whether or not it was likely to be to have been genetically engineered. But 
you wouldn't, depending on what the changes are, you wouldn't always necessarily know. Um, so for example, like you can make one of the advantages of, of genetic engineering is like the precision and the simplicity. Um, so like you can make a change to a single base pair. Um, so like a single, um, you know, piece of, uh, you know, co a bit of code of the DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it would be very hard to, so if you made that change, that change could have arisen naturally as well. So, it, you know, it'd be very hard to identify that as definitively genetically engineered. Um, so, you know, that's where I think the advantage lies in the sense of like that it can have that level of precision that you can make that single base pair change without changing a bunch of other things unintentionally, which is what would happen with sort of like crossbreeding. But um, of course, I guess if, you know, from a, if you're trying to prevent like bad actors, if you're imagining kind of a worst case scenario where, somebody wants to sneakily like genetically engineer a single base pair change and not tell anybody, then that would be harder to tell. Um, but I are, I think my goal is to kind of get to a place where there's no reason to not disclose. I think right now we're creating a situation where um, brands are ashamed of using genetic engineering. So they're trying to hide it, which is how we got into this place in the first place. Right. So right. transparency is like the ultimate, like obvious and needed first step um, on uh, you know, having this conversation and starting to gain trust of consumers. Cause I think that there's just a lot of misinformation out there. And then that fear is flamed even further because the people using genetic engineering are hiding it. So as a, for, for instance, for our product, you know, we say proudly GMO on every bottle and box of, of the product. And we talk about our use of genetic engineering. And I think that that's an important first step. I'm going to get, we're going to get to the product right now, but I just want to say it would, yeah. it would be interesting to say, it, since we want to be transparent about this, this product was genetically modified for this reason. We wanted yes. to increase the flavor exactly. profile. And because it's, when you think of GMO and the consumer thinks of it, and I'm, and I'm not joking about the millennials to the extent that I have nieces that, uh, that like Uncle Paul, why would you even consider eating that? Yeah. Uh, it, it had make them make the argument that you wouldn't know the difference and it actually was modified to do better for us in our bodies. Like there's no reason that GMO by itself is a right. harmful state. And I think that that's an important point is that like to date, I think it's another reason why there's a lot of fear is that to date, the genetic engineering wasn't done for the consumer, right? So if you're in the store and you know, you haven't, you, all you've heard is kind of like this, like vocal minority is like saying like, you know, GMOs are bad. And, and, and that was maybe originally motivated by the idea that like the practices around genetic engineering were bad. And so the, you know, saying like, Oh, they're, they're unsafe or they're unhealthy and um, genetic and anything GMO is bad. Um, and then you walk in the store and you say, okay, I can either buy this can of corn that's GMO, or I could buy this can of corn that's non-GMO. And I don't know much about it, but like, um, I know that GMOs apparently are bad. And so mm -hmm. I'll take the non-GMO one because what's the benefit of me to take the GMO? There's no benefit to me, right? That's like, right. you know, it's yields per acre to the farmer, which is like, right. what do I care about that? I mean, unless you care about sustainability in which you would argue that, that it would be good potentially. Uh, but yeah, that, I think that's a really important thing, right? That if you're using the technology, you explain why you use that technology? What was the benefit? And I think that like aligning that purpose and that value can go a long way, right? Like, so for our product and like you said, we'll get into it, but like we explicitly state like, this is why we genetically engineered and here's the benefit to you. And so I envision a future in which people walk into the store and they look for a genetically engineered probiotic or product because they want the benefit, like the re like it was genetically engineered to do something that has some reason and some benefit. And so you're like, Oh, what does this do? I want that. You know? So I think that that ultimately is how this advances. And that's how I think it should be used is for, for everybody's benefit. You know, the, the, I just learned, and this is my, my 32nd year in this industry and our company's 50th and the noble grape of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is in Bordeaux, France, of course, and all over Napa Valley and all over the world is one of the great grapes is a natural hybrid. And that, that almost freaked me out. It's like this, you would have, wow, I, we hope this is some, you know, ancient grape that's been grown all over right. the world. And it's, but actually it was just a, a hybrid that I don't think it was concocted on by, by man. It just happened in the field between Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. And, and you end up with this really powerful grape that's done amazing things. And you, and now we're saying, well, look, we can just, we can just do that. You know, we just right. do it on our own. Um, and, and I mean, you know, the world opens up at that point, you know? Right. Um, well, I'm going to guess that, uh, <laughs> that the, that this product is not the, uh, anti hangover, uh, uh, ED medicine that we see at the gas station. You guess correctly. <laughs> that's, uh, 
<laughs> it's a little different. Uh, we don't even describe it as sort of like anti hangover because I think even that is sort of like, as you can tell, I mean, very passionate about transparency and, and being, you know, being clear about what we're doing and what we're not doing. And so a hangover as it's kind of currently described has a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people. And it's a cacophony of a lot of different kind of impacts that, that alcohol is having on your body. And so our product is a, is a, so it's called Z biotics and it's a, that's a small, like half ounce, um, liquid beverage. Um, and, uh, uh, half an ounce. It is, yeah, it's very small. So it's just kind wow. of like a quick little shot. Um, and the goal of that was that, you know, we wanted it to be easy to use and, and for people to, to be able to enjoy that simply without having to drink a, a large volume, especially right. if they're going to go and have a nice glass of wine or something, it'll be full. Um, and so, uh, this half ounce is just water and it's, we've suspended it in our, our proprietary probiotic strain. Um, and so it's a pro a probiotic is a live bacteria, um, that you can eat. Um, and, um, there are many probiotics out there that do all mm -hmm. kinds of different things. And, um, but all of them are much like we were just talking about, um, everything except for ours, ours is the world's only, uh, it was the world's first and still only genetically engineered probiotic in existence on the market uh, um, for any, so, for any purpose, for any purpose, for gut uh, health or anything. Yes, exactly. And so everything, all the other probiotics that are out there are just things that we found in the ground, um, that mm -hmm. we found were not harmful to people that we then put into pills and gave to people and sort of make various claims about it. And, um, without getting into too much detail there, I mean, I think that, um, because if, you know, your, your, the goal there is to sort of have some effect on your gut and your gut health. And right in your gut, there is this community of microbes. Um, and I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole there, but that, you know, that community of microbes is called the microbiome and, um, and, and it has all these sort of effects on your body. And so the idea or the hypothesis behind probiotics is that these, that you would take this like good bacteria, um, mm -hmm. probiotic bacteria, and that it would get in there and somehow affect your microbiome in some way that would be beneficial. Um, and since everybody's microbiome is different, like you literally have as many bacterial cells in your gut as you, as you do human cells in your whole body. Um, and so everybody's community, it's constantly changing and they're all different. So the idea that this sort of silver bullet, this like bacteria could get in there into everybody's microbiome, which is totally different and uniformly perform, um, uh, a beneficial activity is, is not a very strong hypothesis from a microbiological standpoint, I'll mm -hmm. say. And, and the data is consistent with that. We see that, you know, I think it, the most generous thing you can say is that it, the probiotics, some probiotics can help some people sometimes. Um, and so, you know, if you're taking a probiotic and it makes you feel better then it's helping you, you know, that that's great, but the consistency is, um, is not there. So what we did was we took, we took the starter, which is a really cool idea, right? That we have these like live bacteria that could go in and possibly do something beneficial for you. And then we use genetic engineering to ensure that that would happen. Um, so basically we take a safe edible bacteria that you eat every day of your life. Um, and then we genetically engineered it to express an enzyme similar to one your liver uses called an acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Um, and this enzyme breaks down acetaldehyde specifically. And acetaldehyde is this very toxic metabolic byproduct of alcohol. And it's part of the reason, part of the reason that you feel not so great the day after drinking. Um, uh, and so we, you know, essentially have created a bacteria that can reliably, as it's passing through your gut, it's, it doesn't have to affect your microbiome in any way. It just, the bacteria pass through your gut and they help your body basically break down this acetaldehyde that is forming as the alcohol gets metabolized. Um, and, uh, you know, remove that so that you, uh, feel better the next day. It's a very simple idea. We're really using a probiotic as the chassis to deliver a biological function. Um, one that's, that we know to be important. Um, and so that will help, um, you know, but of course the way you feel the next day isn't entirely due to acid aldehyde. It's also due to, um, certain direct effects of alcohol itself. Like, so the ethanol itself is causes poor sleep. Um, it sort of disrupts some of your endocrine balance. So, so you deal with some of that stuff, but the acid aldehyde is this highly toxic molecule that was, you know, kind of results in a lot of that, that real misery that you can sometimes feel, um, uh, the next day. And so kind of, we figured if we, if we helped you tackle that, which is something that's difficult to, to kind of handle and which nothing else in the market was doing that we really give you a leg up the next day. And, and indeed that's kind of what we, we've been seeing. Hey, let's take a break for our sponsor, Total Wine and More. There's always something new to try at Total Wine and More. I love this place. The other day I was in looking for a Napa Red and stumbled across the Prosecco aisle and had to buy this Prosecco that was fabulous for under $8. 
a great alternative to other types of sparkling wines. And then there's French rosé that under $7, which is incredible. A huge selection of Kentucky Burby, Burby, bourbon. And with these low prices, I had to get both the wines that I was looking at. With the lowest prices over 30 years, always find what you love and love what you find at Total Wine & More. You can't buy spirits in Virginia or North Carolina. Please drink responsibly, and you must be 21 to purchase. That's Total Wine & More. Check it out. Back to the show. Are you increasing that uh, chemical? I'm not going to try and repeat it. Are you increasing yeah. it because it's already there naturally, or are you creating it because your body needs oh, it yeah. to help? No, no. So we are. So what we're doing is we are expressing an enzyme, so a protein essentially that can break down that molecule. So that molecule. So you have a, like. So basically, to to just uh, give a high level of kind of like alcohol metabolism in your body. So mm-hmm. when you drink. Um, you know, you drink and, and the ethanol is, you know, the, the alcohol molecule is, is absorbed into your bloodstream and it circulates throughout your body and creates Thank the goodness. effects. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It creates the effects <laughs> okay. that it, it creates. And then, uh, and then it's, it, it is, uh, basically from your blood, it goes into your liver and, it, and it's detoxified, um, by your liver and your liver breaks down that alcohol, that ethanol in two stages. It uses one enzyme to convert the ethanol into acetaldehyde. And then it uses a second enzyme to immediately convert that acetaldehyde, which is very toxic, much more toxic than the alcohol itself, into acetate. Um, and acetate is essentially vinegar. It's innocuous. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, the detoxification of ethanol is done. And subsequent metabolic react- reactions happen from the acetate. But, um, but for all intents and purposes of this story, it's really just two reactions done by two separate enzymes in your liver. Um, and so that um, metabolism is very efficient. Uh, your liver is very good at this. So very little of that intermediate acetaldehyde builds up in the liver. And that's not really the source of acetaldehyde. And so this, so why is our product important then? Um, it's because uh, what is not really appreciated very much, but is well-established in the scientific literature is that a small amount of the alcohol you drink is actually broken down directly in your gut, in large part by your microbiome, but also by some of the cells um, in, your, in your gut epithelium, in the lining of your gut. Um, and so that small amount of alcohol is not particularly important from an alcohol metabolism standpoint. Most of the alcohol is absorbed. Um, but all of the alcohol that is broken down in the gut is converted to acetaldehyde by a uh, bacterial version of that first enzyme in the liver, the alcohol dehydrogenase. And so the, acetal- the alcohol becomes acetaldehyde in the gut, but then it doesn't subsequently be- go from acetaldehyde to acetate uh, because that second enzyme is not very present in your gut. So mm. even though it's the minor source of alcohol metabolism, what happens is that acetaldehyde starts to accumulate in your gut. Um, and uh, acetaldehyde concentrations in the gut actually reach like uh, 10 times higher levels than they do in the bloodstream. Um, and so the, even though it's a very minor source of alcohol metabolism, it ends up being the major source of acetaldehyde formation. And so if you remember, there's this enzyme in your liver that can handle that. And so what happens is normally uh, is that that acetaldehyde that accumulates in the gut is absorbed into your bloodstream. Uh, it's highly soluble like ethanol, and then it circulates throughout your body, and it kind of wreaks havoc throughout your body. It creates inflammation, it um, cell death, all these different things, right? And then it's much like the alcohol from the bloodstream, it goes in the liver, and it's easily kind of broken down in the liver by the acid of the high, uh, dehydrogenase enzyme there, enzyme there. So what we've done with ZBiotics is essentially move that function of the liver, right, this acid of the dehydrogenase enzyme into the gut using a bacteria. Um, and so when you take ZBiotics, you are now just sort of completing the same reaction that was that normally would happen in your liver, but it's happening in your gut uh, where the acid of the hide is initially forming. Um, so that's really kind of the idea behind how Zbiotics works is that we're able to basically deliver to you, to your gut, a new function that it didn't have before. And that's, so, so you, know, you and I are sitting around the house. Ha- we're sitting around the fraternity room, the fraternity house. Uh-huh. Yeah, we're right. partying. We're because <laughs> we're, we're, we definitely. I want to. I want to be clear. We are. This product is not for college kids. This product is okay. for responsible <laughs> adults right. who Let's enjoy, say. like you okay. and I, yeah. who enjoy a few glasses of wine or something, right. uh, and and, uh, and don't want to feel don't want to feel or want to feel their best the next day. All right, fair enough. So we're at. A, I'm at a wine. I was a, a very fancy port tasting over the weekend. I mean, from high end stuff. Okay, that's I'm, a picture. I think I'm with James Suckling. About. You know, the the that's famed right. critic, right? And, sure. and and I say, hey, and I take out this vial. And so in a layman's term, I'm gonna, he's going to say, what is that? I'm going to take this shot. I said, well, you know, I'm going to have these ports. We tasted uh, 25 ports uh, two days in a row. So, you know, we ingested quite a bit of sugar and alcohol. And he says, what is this? Um, so in a layman's, if I, to describe this to somebody, what am I going to tell them? 
You're going to tell them it's a probiotic that has been engineered to break down that toxic byproduct of alcohol that makes you feel terrible the next day. Um, so that's it. Perfect. So you take this probiotic, it breaks down that byproduct, you feel better. Um, you know, so, you know, strip down all the science to just to that nugget. Yeah. And if we're, if we're, we have to take this prior to consuming alcohol, can we take it after or how long do I have to, uh, does it sit there before it's no longer effective if I stop and yeah. start drinking? Totally. So it's a live bacteria that basically passes through your gut. It doesn't see the gut. Um, and so um, it typically, you know, obviously this is very person to person dependent on, on the kind of passage through the, the time that takes the passage to the gut. Um, so, uh, but on average it's about 18 hours is how long the bacteria usually sticks around your gut. And so for mm-hmm. that period of time, it's as it's floating through your gut, it's making this enzyme and helping your body deal with that acetaldehyde. Um, so it only will work if it's in your body before the alcohol, right? Like any alcohol you drink before the product is going to get converted to acetaldehyde and get absorbed in the bloodstream and your body. And then the bacteria won't have access to it. So if you take it before it, or basically I should say the product will help with every drink you have after you take the product. So if you have two drinks, then have zebiotics and then have four more, it'll help with the four more. Um, if, but it's obviously best to take it at the beginning. Um, so it can help with everything. You know, it's interesting because you have a PhD, you've studied the science, you worked in labs, you know, and worked with uh, HIV drugs and et cetera, et cetera. And I go to the gas station, I'm just using as an example, which is funny, but, you know, or you go to the, the homeopathic section of a, of a market or, right. or Sprouts or something, and they have these ideas, it's, it's all herb-based or whatever. And I'd rather I'd rather try something from a PhD who's been studying this all their lives than um, you know, like I say a charlatan, but somebody that's just yeah. professing the stuff. So, um, what you do I have to, is it, are the ingredients labeled? Do I have, do you have to have a prescription? Do, uh, is there, mm-hmm. uh, an FDA clearance on this? What it seems like it, it's yeah. straddling between right. the homeopathic stuff and maybe a prescription. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, that was, you know, the technology, again, you know, the difference between the sort of the technology and the product, right? The technology that we use, um, genetically engineering probiotic bacteria is being used right now by drug companies to develop drugs for certain diseases. Um, because we built this product um, for healthy people um, and it's, you know, a live bacteria that you already eat every day of your life. It's a very common microbe and it's been engineered to express an enzyme expressed already by your body and by 70% of all life on the planet. Um, and there's no, you know, risk of having too much of it or anything that, that there's no real safety concerns, um, uh, or like drug level safety concerns around it, that we can bring this product to market as a food. And so we brought the, so to your first question, yes, we label it and we, you know, so if you look on our, on our box, it's just, you know, it lists our ingredients, just like any other food product. It says water. Um, you know, we have some flavoring in there and, uh, and then we have, um, you know, B subtilis ZB183, which is um, B subtilis is the bacteria and ZB183 is, is our strain of that bacteria. That's ours and proprietary. And, and that's everything that's in the product. And, um, and that's regulated by the FDA um, as a food, um, as with okay. any new food, we had to show extensive safety testing of the, you know, before we introduced the food to the market. Um, and we did that. We did lots of, of different, you know, we showed a lot of the safety around the genetics and we showed the safety of the ingredient in terms of toxicity and allergenicity and, you know, all the things you would do if you had any new food. Um, and then we basically assembled all that data um, into a dossier um, and we submitted it to a panel of expert toxicologists who are, you know, have no skin in the game on our, on our product at all. They're only their own reputations are on the line and they reviewed our data um, and, uh, and determined the product to be safe and said that, yes, uh, you can release this onto the market. And, and so that's what we did. Um, and so that's called the generally recognized as safe or grass. Uh, food pathway, um, which is what we mm. use to bring the product to market. But uh, if we wanted to make a drug, then we, it would obviously be a very different regulatory pathway, but same technology, but applied to something different. I suppose it's no different than any of the probiotics that are out there. Like uh, what's that Japanese thing that comes in a little red bottle. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the idea that like, you know, probiotic, back, there's no reason why this probiotic wouldn't already exist. We just engineered right. it so that there was consistency. Um, and so that we know that this bacteria can express this enzyme, which many bacteria in your gut already express, they just don't express it at the right time or in the right place. So we're really just creating a consistent effect. Um, that's kind of the, the purpose of, of the genetic engineering is just to create something reliable. And the first 
the first um, version of this? Is there more versions? One, have you, have you refined it since you released it? And where is it? Yeah. Uh, so no, because we got approval for this bacteria. So if we made any changes, I mean, we've changed the formulation uh, in terms of like flavor and yeah, stuff, flavor, but uh, right. we have not yeah, changed. Uh, we haven't changed the bacteria at all. Cause if we did, then that would be a new strain at that point. And then we would, would have to go through that, that review process again. And so, um, you know, the product we have now is the original one that, that, um, we invented and, and launched three years ago. Um, you can get it right now only on our website We're we're only selling direct to consumer at the moment. So, you know, zbiotics.com is, is the only, basically the only place we can get, you can get it. We have a few, um, retail locations that are very small, like some, some gyms, um, and, and, uh, uh, and health shops and things like that, um, where they sell, but for all intents and purposes, our, our website is, is where you get it, the product at the moment. Well, you didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs. And you had this idea, you worked in the lab, you're probably looking at some kind of career, you know, that, that might find you in a big, a big, uh, pharmaceutical uh, location, you know, creating drugs or whatever you were doing, but you had this idea to do this. How did you go about convincing people to finances? Yeah, exactly. It can't be cheap to get to where you're at. <laughs> Totally. No, it, uh, it, it isn't. And it, it was a lot of learning and it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, cause when I started, I says no one ever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Well, it's fun, I guess, because I got there, I guess. There's yeah, a lot right, of stuff for sure. there. I mean, we're not, we're, we're not there yet. I guess, you know, we got a lot more work to do, of course, but like, uh, you know, we at least, I at least got to see the vision kind of, we were able to launch the world's first ever genetically engineered probiotic. And I, I feel very proud about that. And I think that that was that the vision when I started with, um, was thanks. Yeah. was that, um, you know, we could, we could do this, that like, there's that this, you know, we started the whole conversation about kind of like my passion for this technology and, and all the good it can do for humanity. I think that like genetic engineering is a great tool in our toolbox as humanity to deal with some of our existential crises around, you know, feeding a growing population of people and dealing with emerging diseases, um, as well as dealing with climate change. I mean, all these things are things that genetic engineering can help with and, you know, it getting thrown in the bus, under the bus for kind of commercial uh, reasons is, is was, it was something that was frustrating me personally. Um, and uh, I certainly wouldn't defend all of the ways that genetic engineering has been used, but I do think that the technology can be useful. And so um, I wanted to do something about that. And then simultaneously, I had this idea around the fact that we could take a live probiotic safe bacteria that you can eat and then engineer it to do something very useful and specific for you, whatever that may be. And so like, that was really the core of the idea um, and the first time I pitched that idea, it was for a totally different indication. It was like very, uh, a very cool academic scientific idea that was objectively a very bad one from a commercialization perspective. Like it was around protecting your gut from, uh, radiation exposure. And, um, it was really not wow. something that anybody would ever care about, but that was the original idea for the, you know, just showing that like, it took me a while to kind of figure out what would make sense commercially. And, um, and then, so after my PhD, I actually was designing clinical trials for drug companies, working at a, a CRO, a contract research organization, designing clinical trials for, for drug companies. And, and I learned a lot about what it took to bring a technology to market. Um, and I saw that there was a really big opportunity here that all the best science was being used um, by the, by drug companies to develop drugs. And, and I knew that little old me couldn't compete with like, you know, the Pfizer's and the Roche's of the world, but that there was a lot of good this technology could do otherwise. And if I sort of match that with, my desire to kind of elevate this conversation around genetic engineering, I thought, what well, you know, nobody chooses human insulin. You take it because you have to. And so there's no mm -hmm. kind of choice being made around genetic engineering there. But if I created a product that created some benefit for people that they wanted and was very transparent about my use of genetic engineering to create that benefit, then people will be armed with the information um, to make a decision for themselves and, and make an, a, a choice uh, for or against genetic engineering. And I, and I think that people haven't really been given that opportunity before. So the idea that I could make a product that we could bring to market and, and sell to people in the grocery store where they had it or on a, eventually in the grocery store, on our website where people would have a choice around um, the use of genetic engineering and, and do the cost benefit analysis, I thought was a really exciting idea. And so that was the, was part of the big motivation. And then finding a, an indication for people that, that made sense, um, you know, I originally pitched kind of like that next day misery after drinking as sort of a joke, um, never thinking that's what I was going to do, but people got really excited about it and they clearly understood what the benefit was. I realized that like that could be a great way to kind of introduce the technology. We're obviously, or may, maybe it's not obvious, but, but um, we are very excited about the broad reaching potential of this, of genetically engineered probiotics. And we're building lots of products to do all kinds of different 
things. And so this was really just meant to be the introduction to the world of, of the tech and the proof of concept, but uh, there's a lot more stuff we can do. I think that's brilliant, actually, when you pick uh, something as down to earth and close to everybody's heart as, you know, anti hangover, but it still seems like to me uh, the headwinds to a GMO product uh, as well as, you know, the snake oil idea, because we've seen so many of these anti hangover yeah. ideas. And we were talking a little bit about glutathione, which is a, a natural product of the liver that's supposed to help break down alcohol. And I was telling you about this product where you rub on your stomach and your comment back was, yeah, well, you know, where's the science of that? And I understand that. Right. But again, and, and I, there, you know, there could be the snake oil concept behind that or this, but just the headwinds, just the perception of, yeah. oh, sure. Definitely. You're going to help me with my hangover. I mean, have you sensed right. that? And, and, oh, and absolutely. I, it's the, you, you know, the, regardless of what you, uh, of, of who you are, or where you come from, the first thing that anybody thinks in the hair of the pro about the product is just eye roll, uh, you know, and like a lot of skepticism. And so we have to kind of, you know, yes, climb that hill a little bit with people and be like, hold on, like, hear me out. Like, this isn't just sort of like random vitamins or like plant extracts. I swept into a bottle that you see at the gas station, right? Like it's, you know, this is <laughs> cutting edge, like biotechnology that like, you know, we worked really hard on that is very rationally designed from the get go. And there's nothing else like it on the planet. And so we sort of climb the hill and then to your point around the GMO headwind, Believe it or not, it's, uh, this is one of those kind of pervasive myths um, that in the U.S. at least, um, there is a very vocal minority um, of people who are anti-GMO. And then the rest of uh, people are either. So interestingly, if you uh, if you look, so there's a lot of research on this. So if you look at unbiased research, right, like if you ask very loaded questions, like would you prefer a non-GMO product? Um, people are mostly going to say yes to that, right? Mm -hmm. But if you ask like unbiased and unloaded questions and you kind of take a, the real temperature of kind of people, consumers in the U.S., um, like Pew research did a big thing on this. We've done a ton of research on this as well, um, in lots of focus groups and things. And, um, what we find is that like the majority of people, um, actually are, have no opinion or think positively about GMOs. Um, it's about 60% of the population doesn't really care one way or the other. Um, and so already there, you know, we're talking about like, if you're designing a product for men, you've already eliminated 50% of the population. We're only at most eliminating 40%. Uh, yeah, you know, right, right. and That's then even point. with, with the 40% who are anti-GMO, it's really only about a third to half of them that are really vehemently anti-GMO. And, and so that 15 to 20% of the population is, is really creating a lot of the fervor. And I think that, that the, the, the other kind of half are, uh, you know, the other 20 to 30% of people are, are uh, they're anti-GMO. It's a conviction loosely held. They're like, I, I've heard it's bad. I don't really know why, but um, I try to avoid it because I, I've heard it's bad for you. And so yeah, right. if you basically present people with like, Hey, this is a product, this is, we use genetic engineering. That's what makes it good. That's what makes it work. Um, that's what makes it special. And like, here's what the benefit is to you. Those people are like, oh, huh, I'm interested. I'd like to try that. Um, and it, and you know, it eliminates the sort of like mystique or, or, or mystery around it. So I'd say that the anti-GMO headwind has not been as strong for us because I think that most people are open to new technology when it's explained to them and they're given a choice, um, an honest choice, as opposed to kind of having it snuck in there, you know? You know, it's, it's interesting because it happens in our industry. It happens in all uh, consumer products. I mean, we're experiencing the non-GMO thing right now, but um, for wine, for instance, this fit vine wine, this, uh, that wine is a, some kind of health beverage and we're going to make it healthier for you. Uh, we're we're going to reduce the sugar and whatever, whatever else they're doing to it. And then, Oh, by the way, we're going to remove all the flavor and it's going to taste like <laughs> hell. And it's right. all of a sudden now you're drinking this stuff that tastes like kombucha for no reason because you think it's better for you when it's like you're not taking it in the first place as some kind of health beverage, right? I mean, if you if you buy quality wine, you're going to get no sugar. You're going to get proper structure. You're not going to get additives. But if you're going to buy, you know, 19 crimes or something, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of crap in it. But for the most part, we're being bamboozled into thinking that these brands on the shelf that are supposed to be healthy for you are no more healthy than just a quality made wine. Do you, do you drink wine yourself? Uh, I do. Uh, I wouldn't call myself like necessarily like a connoisseur, but I definitely drink wine with my wife. Uh, uh, and yeah, I would agree with you that I think that it's about the purpose of the wine, right? Like if you drink wine because you enjoy it, like you acknowledge that it's not a, a health drink. And, uh, and so trying to kind of like, that's all brand play, right? That, that they're trying to convince you that you can sort of like, uh, you know, that, that their wine is going to be better for you in some way. If they can't compete, like you say, on quality, then they're going to do this other thing. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, if you want a healthy drink, don't, 
to like you know, drink, drink, drink smoothies or whatever it is. You know, our smoothies are probably not that healthy either, but yeah, no. you know, drink something healthy. I, you know, it's so like, uh, you know, the idea that we can sort of like, uh, you know, just exactly. And I think we all deal with this, right? It's like, there's a, it's so pervasive that like, these things like you know it's back in the 90s right if it was fat free it was healthy right and we obviously know that like you know these things were loaded with sugar and, and preservatives yeah, and things like right. that they're, they're not healthy for you at all uh but it was, it was fat free right and then you know now it's like sugar free it's like healthy but it's like you know again like just because it's a vegan doesn't make it healthy at all right it just means that it doesn't have animal products in it and so people kind of use these trigger words and these keywords to to really bamboozle or trick people and i think that that's really antithetical to our brand right we we try to be very open and transparent and treat people like adults. Don't trick people. Don't leave misleading comments. A good example of this is like, you know, we talked about regulations and we said like, um, you asked if we were regulated by the FDA and I said, yeah, we are. And you know what a lot, uh, you know, and so there's FDA approval, which is preserved for drugs. Um, mm -hmm. So FDA only approves drugs. If so, if you file uh, investigative new drug application and you go through all the clinical trials at the end, you get a drug and you have FDA approval of that drug. If you're not a drug, if you're a food or a supplement, there is no FDA approval. The FDA regulates you, but does not approve you. And so you can be compliant with FDA regulations, but you are not FDA approved. And a lot of supplement companies will, will have them big letters like on their website or on their bottle, like FDA compliant. Um, which is so misleading, right? They want you to think FDA approved. They want you to think we're a drug, but in reality, what you're all they're saying is that they manufactured this like without, you know, allowing you know insects into the you know into the manufacturing yeah, right. process, right? Like just kept it clean, and and so you know it's 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 things like that that I think that like you know they're looking to trick people, and I think that's something that's really frustrating for me is because right now people are being tricked into believing that certain things make the product better that they don't, and so we're we're really trying to kind of elevate that a little bit, that conversation a little bit. There is no definition, uh, FDA definition for natural food. Even people, you, if you, if your bagel bag says natural, it means nothing. <laughs> yeah. In right. Fact, it's, yeah. it's almost, uh, I think it, on the website, the FDA website, it says something to the effect of, well, natural, we, we just say, we assume that there's nothing in there that shouldn't be in there. That, but right. there's no, there, it's not to prescribe. Same with wine. There's no, everybody talks about natural sure. wine. There is no such thing as natural wine. Right. Uh, maybe totally. no arsenic is totally natural, you know, yeah, like, I mean, like right. uh, natural to means literally nothing like uh, everything. You know, Does this work on natural. distilled spirits as well as fermented products? It's the same alcohol. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, so it's all about the right? molecules like, the it, same. Exactly. Ethanol, right. Is convert, regardless of where the source is, if it's from wine, beer or, um, you know, uh, spirits, right. That, that ethanol in your body is processed the exact same way. Um, the ethanol is converted into acid, mm -hmm. aldehyde, and then converted to acid. So the reason why you might feel different after drinking those things is, is you do a whole bunch of, a host of other things, like mostly the rate at which your body absorbs the alcohol, but there's several other kind of smaller impacts as well, like um, byproducts of, of fermentation and different things like that. But um, in general, it's really just about ethanol and acid, aldehyde. And you're going to get acid, aldehyde if you drink ethanol, regardless of where it comes from. You know, it's interesting. I drink gin because I feel like drinking gin. My father was a gin drinker. And I drink a Manhattan bourbon based because I feel like that, that w what it's going to do. And that's the difference. But I, and I also have cravings for particular wines. And I, that's probably not based on the alcohol. It's probably based on the, on the flavor profile, but the taste, you yeah. know, it's, yeah, the flavors. Um, Cause I do have a healthy cocktail that I created. I call it the uh, Russian Olympian, right? There's the black Russian, the white Russian, Right. Uh, and then the Russian vodka. But this is uh, Russian vodka, muscle milk <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> vanilla bitters. Right. So you get a little buzz and then you get like 30 grams of protein for every. Right. <laughs> every glass so go hit the gym. Yeah, you'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a fascinating conversation. We're almost on an hour and I don't want to take any more time, but I'm going to do I'm going to do something here with you. Have some fun since you're uh, in the, um, the the industry the alcohol industry, as well as a microbiologist, because I have this book here. It's called wine is the best medicine. It's a, a French MD He's also a homeopathic doctor as well. And so he wrote a book on human maladies and the various types of French wines only. So I only do this uh, with well, people like you and, and French winemakers. If I do it to an Italian guy, they, they don't get They're never happy. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to give you a malady here. And then I'm going to give you three choices of wines that you may or may not be familiar with. But the funny thing, the answer to this question is related to um, the compound of the wine. So okay. let's say you had hypertension. Okay. You could have a glass of champagne. 
uh, not a glass. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the dosage afterwards, but you could have champagne yeah. if you have hypertension. You could have a Sancerre, which is a French white wine from the you know, southwest of France, or you could have a red wine from Bordeaux, France. That one. Cabernet. The red one. The Bordeaux. So what would be, so now if you were to study, and I brought this up the other day in a podcast, if you were to study to be a master uh, sommelier or the, uh, earn the master of wine credential, you would have to defend the answers to your questions, either wrong or right. So what's what's the defense yeah. of Bordeaux? So the Bordeaux is because the hypertension, uh, uh, acetaldehyde is a vasodilator, um, which is what creates the flushing reaction. So uh, red wines are much higher in, in acetaldehyde. And as a so acetaldehyde is a not to be confused with the acetaldehyde. It's the same molecule, but um, the acetaldehyde being produced by your body is a breakdown product of ethanol. Um, some acetal some alcohols have acetaldehyde in them as a congener, as a byproduct of the fermentation process. And so red wines are high in acetaldehyde. Um, higher in acetaldehyde um, naturally already. Um, and so that would be a, a vasodilator, which I would suspect would counteract some of the hypertension. Uh, that, that's, that would be my pick. Okay. So, uh, you know, we're going to go a little longer here because that's the most granular descri- uh, answer I've ever heard. So we would just, give you, <laughs> we would just say yes, because, you know, you answered it with this granularity, but the answer according <laughs> to them anyway, is the Sancerre. And the reason he says that is because it's, uh, these wines are more of a diuretic for one, and they cause the, the release of your, uh, urea chlorides and uric acid. Therefore, they help eliminate okay. the excess of organic liquid, which promotes the blood plethora. Okay. Uh, and the dosage is two glasses per meal. However, this doctor didn't have the technologies available to him as you do right, today. Right, so right. He's, he's, okay. He's, well, but then I didn't think one, about it from the diuretic perspective. That's interesting. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, I just, the reason I brought it up again is that hypochlorohydria, okay. which is sluggishness of the stomach. And since we're talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, probiotic, let's take a look at this. Sluggish of the stomach, good digestion is often more important than good food. Digestion is a process which takes it in an acid milieu. Poor digestion is often due to either the lack of tone in the gastric muscle or an insufficiency of digestive secretions. And those two phenomena are, in most cases, associated. That makes sense so far? Yeah. So a cure is a matter of restoring to the weakened stomach its normal muscular tone in a properly acidic milieu. And so the answer to the question of sluggish stomach sluggishness was champagne with a favorable pH. Mm-hmm. Again, yeah, there'd be a, a, a higher P, a lower pH, which uh, would I would agree. I was I was expecting the opposite. I was expecting uh, the the prediction of a uh, of a low pH, but actually that would not work in that direction. So a higher pH beverage would create higher pH in the stomach. Yeah. Excuse me. Low, I'm sorry. A low lower pH, pH right. low pH. I'm sorry. A, a higher acidity is what I meant to say. So right. like 2.85 low pH. pH. Yeah, exactly. And so that would, that would also create a low pH, a, a high acidity, a high acidity in the stomach. So the hypo, uh, what was it? Hypochlorurea or whatever. Uh, yes. like the hypo that's a hypo, hypo is low. And then chloro is like hydrochloric acid is the, the acid. So you have low acid in the stomach and then, uh, you drink an acidic beverage to actually boost the acid in your stomach. It's incredible. We should go through the whole book. It says here, uh, tannins, glucides, <laughs> natural carbon dioxide. Moreover, they contain potassium as a bitartrate uh, whose effect on the flexibility of the muscle fibers is known. Uh, but isn't that fun? That uh, is very and, fun. Totally. And the, dose, the dosage is two glasses after meal. So, you know, the worst, there are a couple of ailments here where the guy says, we're not sure, but you feel better anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. Totally. We don't know why, but yeah. yeah that's cool. Zach has been cool. a fascinating conversation and I am definitely going to log on and see if we can bring some uh, Z-Biotic in here and, and put it to the you know clinical test here, right? Right here. One Absolutely. Of the I mean, hey, you got it. You got to test it. It's science, man. On Tuesdays, I taste uh, usually 75 wines before the end of the day and I get home wow. and, you know, we're going to start that this time. It's such a fascinating conversation. And I, like I said, when we're up in San Francisco, we're going to come see you and we'll, we'll do it live and we'll peel it back a little further. That'd be awesome. I'd love that. that. Um, it's been super fun. Thank you, Paul, so much for the conversation. And the, Z-Bio- the website again is zbiotics.com? Correct. Yeah. You check it out. Thanks again. All right. Cool. Thank you. Cheers. Excellent. Print it. Hey, that was great. That was really fun. Good. I really loved it. I'm so glad we got to dive into the GMO stuff. That's my favorite topic. So I'm really glad we got to get there. That's great. I've been asking that question literally of anybody that thought remotely have an answer and you're the only ones had one uh, because of hybrid, uh, particularly in the food. My daughter Mm -hmm. 
you know, I have one daughter who only feeds her kid, the one year old and seventh old, all those things we're talking about, non GMO, whatever. Right. She's not a vegan, but uh, right. you know, organic, whatever. And the other one, you know, she'll, she'll give her kids cheeses at nine o'clock at night. So it doesn't yeah, right. <laughs> well, let me, uh, can I give you something to, sure. to tell that first daughter? Yeah. Um, like, so there's this really great, I, I think it's really important. People believe that getting into that sort of like nature is good idea, right? Like the people believe that organic is natural and therefore safer um, and mm-hmm. therefore healthier. And so there's plenty of arguments you can make on like, you know, the environmental impact of, of kind of modern farming techniques with like lots of, pesticides and things like that. But from a human health perspective, there's actually good data to support that, that organic food is not safer uh, for you, uh, which is very interesting. So there's this, this scientist um, named Bruce Ames, um, and he developed the Ames test, which is a way of testing how carcinogenic something is and a very simple test um, that he developed to do that. Mm. Um, and um, he showed, interestingly, that uh, his basically is the, he has a seminal paper where he is scientific paper where he releases the information there. And he, um, he showed in that paper and the, the, the paper started by saying like, people want to go back to a time when, when humans were at harmony with nature and that time never existed. Like plants are toxic and dangerous and it's been a struggle our whole lives. Um, and he, he said like, uh, and he showed in this paper that um, organic foods on average were several times more carcinogenic than non-organic than conventionally grown foods, which is counterintuitive. But the, the explanation mm. was, and as he went in and he did the chemical analysis was basically that like, when a plant is grown with pesticides, it doesn't get attacked by pests as much. When a plant is grown without pesticides, the, um, the, plant, the plant gets attacked and all these pesticides come from naturally, like the plant can make its own natural pesticides mm-hmm. and those can't be washed, washed off. They're intrinsic to the plant and those are still toxic molecules right? because plants can make very toxic molecules. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, while you're using synthetic pesticides, you know, the FDA has very strict regulations about they have to be washed off. There's so many parts per billion. And, and so you're actually getting a very low dose, if anything, um, of those non, uh, of those conventionally grown plants. But if you take an organic, say, uh, one of the big ones you showed was like organic coffee had like 10,000 times more carcinogen in it than non-organic coffee than conventional coffee. And that's because you can't wash the, those toxins off. They're intrinsic to the plant. So, um, the idea that you only feed your kid organic food because it's better for them is actually, you're actually giving your kid larger doses of carcinogens every time you give them conventional. That's really fascinating. So Bruce Ames and the Ames test, um, you know, looking, uh, you know, that that's uh so anyway, that's always like my, the soapbox I get on about organic food, you know, I don't know if you can see this book back here. Yeah. Uh, it's Robert's uh, Steiner's book, uh, called agriculture, which was the birthplace of biodynamic farming, et cetera. And th- what you just said is an amazing, uh, sort of not counter to that, but yeah. Why wouldn't, why we, wouldn't a plant be fighting for itself and creating the things exactly. to protect itself? all the things we use are derived from plants. So like to your, I didn't get to answer as much as I wanted to in the, in the interview, but like the idea that like, um, you know, biodynamic farming is, has a lot of really great things to it. And so does genetic engineering. And I think that they're both trying to accomplish the same thing. And I think that the ultimate most sustainable, healthiest thing we can do is to use, use elements of both, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are pitfalls and drawbacks to sort of organic farming. There are really great things about organic farming and crop rotation and dynamic farming, right? That they make a ton of sense. Um, but then there are things that it can't do like it. And, and then there are things that genetic engineering absolutely can help with and can do. So I think that those two things together are where humanity should be as with anything, the middle ground is always probably the right, right? Like, you know, like yeah, right. too far on extreme on either side is, is usually where we fall into trouble. So I'm going to, maybe we'll put that in anyway. We can edit this a little sure. bit, but that was that's sure. an interesting sure. point because, uh, and, and the other thing we didn't talk about, which I would, we could talk about next time, but the climate change idea, I mean, there are, I don't, I try not to get into political discussion here about why there's climate change, but you know, in the vineyards of the world, there clearly is. Right. And you know, they're all fighting to figure out ways through trellising or canoping, um, you know, some vineyards that couldn't produce before now are producing, which is kind of interesting, positive byproduct of the uh, slightly higher temperatures. And there's even regions of the world now that are making wines that couldn't do it before, like England. Couldn't before. Exactly. Yeah. So I I don't know if this is a total bad thing, but I suppose that this could be applied to uh, creating, you know, they already created, you know, phylloxera resistant rootstock. Exactly. You know, so. so It's exactly that genetic engineering can can be used to create like more drought resistant, uh, like, uh, you know, crops and uh, make them more hardy or resistant to heat. Um, All kinds of things that like would help us 
deal with the rising temperature, mm-hmm. right? All these crops were optimized biologically for a different temperature zone than we're living in right now. Um, and so, you know, genetic engineering can help us kind of move with that. Um, yeah, at the very interesting. Minute. So yeah. interesting. All right. I won't take any more time. Uh, we'll do it again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Real I really pleasure. appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul Callum Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. And of course, all these podcasts are sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, 48 years in business. Don't forget to visit our website, wineofthemonthclub.com.